Are we? Uh, we're not doing video, are we? Uh, you don't need to if you don't want to. If you want to stay anonymous, but we typically always do video and we'll show it, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, let's uh, leave me off video. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the anonymity. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, they'll, they'll they'll put a sign up uh, at the airport of me, and uh, I'll never get into. The, the- <laughs> You'll be on the do not uh, serve list and all the distilleries. This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Danner has been making boots for 85 years for the unforgiving Pacific Northwest. Their Stronghold series is inspired by hikers, but built for the toughest working conditions. Order online or find your local store at danner.com. Hey everyone, we are beginning the process of rebranding. We're gonna have a brand new logo, so look out for some things to come in the following weeks, as well as a change in our website, our t-shirts, everything else we also give away to our Patreon supporters. We're very stoked to launch it soon because it does look awesome. Today's guest is Lloyd Christmas, or better known as Bourbon Truth on Twitter and blogs. He's known for his anger towards the bourbon industry, and it's almost a right within its own to get called out by him, which means that you've probably made it. He was a guest back on episode 94, so go back and listen to that one before you listen here, and you're gonna know why he has it out for some folks. Remember, if you wanna get every new episode emailed straight to your inbox, go to birdpursuit.com, scroll down just a little bit, and you're gonna find our newsletter sign up. Go ahead, sign up there, and every new episode is gonna come straight to your inbox automatically. Make sure you're subscribing to us on iTunes. Also keep those iTunes reviews coming in. That's what keeps us the number one bourbon podcast out there. Go to YouTube. You can also watch all these videos that happen on YouTube or Facebook, but I know YouTube is growing in popularity, so subscribe to our channel, as well as make sure you leave comments on some of the videos if you like what you're listening to. And as always, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and always support us on Patreon if you can. With that, enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Today is going to be another repeat guest that we've had on before. Ryan hasn't had the pleasure of, of no. talking to him, but anybody that listened to the last podcast with him enjoyed it very much because he is uh, an unfiltered yet knowledgeable resource in the world of bourbon. So are you excited for this one? <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm, I enjoy his uh, pithy uh, sarcasm <laughs> that he displays on Twitter, but excuse me uh, for sounding like this. I have a sinus infection. Uh, <laughs> not only is Kentucky the bourbon capital, or it's the allergy capital of the world. It all really is. Stream highs and lows. But uh, anyways, I appreciate, yeah, Mr. Lloyd Christmas coming on with us. Yeah. It's going to be a fun one. So if, if anybody that doesn't know the name Lloyd Christmas in the bourbon world, uh, he goes by the uh, the pseudonym of Bourbon Truth. Uh, bourbon Truth at Tumblr, Bourbon Truth on Chris, uh, Christmas. I forgot to say because Lloyd Christmas in my head. Uh, and it's Christmas. And we're getting around to that time. So uh, you know, Lloyd, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. Or should I say, yeah, welcome back. So Did you already asked this the last episode? I can't remember. Is Dumb and Dumber your favorite movie? Is that what it is? Is that really where it stems from? That's where that's where it comes from. I uh, decided uh, when all this started, I don't know, it was probably about five years ago. I just decided that uh, it was going to be uh, a um, a fun frolic of uh, with with very little intelligence built in, <laughs> and uh, that was uh, that was the best thing I could come up with at the time. I love it. It's stuck. I mean, everybody knows who Lloyd Christmas yeah. is. Yeah. Every every time Dumb and Dumber comes on TBS or it like no matter how many times I see it, I like watch it and like I ruin the rest of my day because I like <laughs> just stop and wear everything yeah. and watch yeah. it. <laughs> well, and so for anybody that is trying to watch the video of this and wondering, well, why is why is Lloyd's screen black? Well, Lloyd is uh, uh he keeps himself anonymous. Uh he still wants to make sure that he has 
plenty of enemies. However, he doesn't want the <laughs> the enemies to know his face, so they can see him on the street and typical you know, uh, shiv him in the back or something. Typical internet character, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? Con- contrary to popular belief, I do meet plenty of people. I just uh, don't go out of my way to uh, make it easy. <laughs> That's quite all right with us. But um, yeah, it makes it makes it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, there's uh, places I would like to still be welcome in, <laughs> and there's places that huh, I'm probably not welcome in if they knew who I was. So uh, it makes it easier on me. Yeah, allows you to be honest, be yourself. Yeah, we can do that. So the uh, the reason why we asked you to come back on is kind of just get an idea of, of what's new the, that you feel that is is you need to gripe about, or is there <laughs> is there something that is kind of in the in the past? Because let's see, you came on about I, I think it was uh, it was in the early seventies, I think maybe during that 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 episode we had on, and so that was quite a while ago. And since then, I don't want to say bourbon's changed as much, but the uh, the social factors changed a little bit so kind of talk about you know something that is that's been bothering you lately um well i i, I put a post up last night on uh bourbon truth uh, on the tumblr uh that that's probably one that's probably one of the most uh recent ones on just the stupidity of the drink <laughs> and just how dumb people are doing things and it, it's uh, if if you haven't read it or if people haven't gotten to it yet, uh, I cover a couple of different things. But one of the things that stood out in my mind and I just couldn't take it anymore, I had to speak out on it, is people buying partial bottles. It's like you're buying secondary. That's that's one thing that that's almost become quasi acceptable. I mean, I don't know if we can even count secondary as black market anymore in in a, in a strange way where it is. But having partial bottles being sold and sa- sample and bottle splits being sold, uh, some of the things that are, people are just throwing their money away on right now are just insane. Um, the the amount of money that people are spending uh, on bottles. Um, if I go back and I looked at my blog and I looked at the different, uh, you know, each year or so, I write another one. I keep talking about how expensive things are and how shocking things are when they're expensive. It keeps getting worse and worse. And uh, I, I use the example of black prints. Uh, I, can't, I can't understand how people are spending, paying $500 for that crap uh, that's there without really knowing much about it, except knowing that uh, Whistlepig doesn't do a very good job at uh, keeping money in your pocket. <laughs> they sure don't. I mean, uh, it's it's just another source for dry whiskey, right? And and they are definitely pushing the bounds of what people are going to be paying in the secondary market, or not even that, paying in the uh, the retail market for it. Yeah, I mean, they're they're trying to make it sound like it's a, um, you know, something awfully special, and you know, um, uh, I didn't read the article because I would have vomited in my mouth, but. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 the, the whiskey uh, advocate from this month uh, this quarter had an article in there about what to collect, and they had uh, Raj, formerly from Whistle Peak, because I hear he's been fired. Finally, um, he uh, did an article, and he called the uh, farmstead as uh, the um, collectible. That he would that, that, that what he would re- recommend for a collectible that in ten years will be worth ten thousand dollars, and that's like sounds like Bitcoin. You know, well, Bitcoin at least did it. You know, his his swill's never going to do it, um, mm-hmm. especially not Farmstead uh, or, or the or the farm stock. I think they call it not Farmstead, and um, they're. Um, but uh, thinking of yourself as a future collectible that you should put up on a uh, shelf, never touch it, is, a, is, is pretty pompous because most people will tell you they want you to drink it, you know, and that's where it belongs, being opened up and drank. Uh, so when you but see, most people, uh, you mean like the distilleries, right? Like that's that's their that's their goal at the end of the day, right? They're not they're not trying to create something that is just a, a shelf trophy, needless right. to say. Well. It's hard. It's hard for somebody to put out a, uh, you know, a uh, a bottle that 
is really expensive. I mean, if you look at if you look at the Russell's 1998 bottle, that bottle must have cost a lot of money to make. And if you remember the Russell's tradition, really, you know, they, they put a lot of money into the packaging of those. It's hard to believe that somebody's going to drink through those and throw those in the trash. So either they're expecting that somebody's going to keep it after the fact or that someone's going to keep it. Um, but, uh, you know, having it as a, a, a collectible, um, you know, it, it's it's definitely something that's happening more and more now. Right. You never really saw. A couple of years ago, nobody would ever dare say, yeah, here's a collectible and this is something that you're never going to drink about. The only ones that I won't open are the uh, signed bottles that were signed by people that I give a shit about. You know, there's a lot of people that who cares, you know, the the guy that's supposed to be the master distiller, like a, uh, a Dave Pickerel that's the master distiller of 142 different places. You know, I don't really care if I ever open a bottle of that. It's got his signature on it or not, because the guy hasn't turned a knob in probably 50 years. So, um, but there, there are, there are bottles that I'll, that I'll save as that are more, um, uh, you know, more personal to me and sentimental than I'm going to save because they're collectibles. Mm -hmm. uh, collectible. I'm hoping it's going to get drank one way or another. If I don't drink it, it gets sold and somebody else is going to drink it. At least that's the thought process. But uh, thank what you. What kind of bottles? Where? Yeah, what kind ahead. of bottles are you talking about keeping? What are collectibles for you? Uh you know what? I guess I, it's got to be some of those Hershes <laughs> that you got stuck away in the basement. I, I've I've sold off my Hershes. I've sold off my. Uh, um, I, I I I I haven't really told too many people this, but uh, I had a very very sizable collection, over a thousand bottles, that I sold off. And I turned my collection into a condo on the beach in Florida. There you go. <laughs> nice. That's the best way to do it right now. You got in early and you had an investment. Yeah. So, um, so that's, that's my, my, uh, my joke now is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, my collect, my collections in Florida and that's where it is. So I, I sold off most of those that the Pappy that, um, that I have, uh, you know, I, I keep a couple bottles of that for, rainy days if i have clients that i need to get a bottle of pappy to but i've got a couple of bottles of pappy opened and there's nothing wrong with pappy uh i know that lately it's going downhill and there's reasons for that i think but um um i i don't get all weak in the knees like most people do when they see a bottle of uh a, a van winkle mm -hmm. so you know you had mentioned that uh, a few different things, right? And may, maybe a little contradictory as well. And so as, as saying that, you know, people shouldn't buy these as shelf trophies or investments. However, it seems that it sort of just happened to work out for you that you, <laughs> they just turned into investments for you, right? Playing devil's advocate. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I, I don't buy 1800 bottles to drink. Um, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm fortunate that I'm not quitter and uh it would be pretty damn hard for me to go through that many if i were <laughs> no i understand um, uh, but you know uh, you know an example for you is um when uh booker's 25 was due to come out i made it a point to be at the store when they first got it in and try it and this is before anybody had really heard of it or really cared about it and I had it, and it was phenomenal. It was it was one of the best bourbons I've ever had. And with that, I bought about 40 bottles of it. Uh, not planning on drinking all of them, obviously saving some, but I bought a whole ton of it uh, with the intent to sell it at some point. Um, now, if a truck pulled up and it had black prints on it, um, I'm not buying any of it. I mean, at some point, I'll probably... Uh, try it. I've had people that have told me that it tastes like good $70 rye. Um, I don't need to know much more than that. So at some point I'll try and I'll have it myself. And I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just saying that for $500, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. And I, I would never buy one of those because 
I don't think the value will go up. And I think that uh, it, it's, it's going to stay where it's at. If um, I'll give you another example. I was in a, uh, a liquor store probably about three years ago, and there was a clearance bin, and it was in a shopping cart. And I went into the shopping cart, and I looked in the shopping cart, and it was full of Black Maple Hill, old Black Maple Hill, 20-year-old, 21-year-old, 18-year-old. And this is when Black Maple Hill was pretty much gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and the um, probably the small batch ha- was going to be coming out shortly. So it hadn't really gone completely crazy, but it was pretty much gone from shelves. And I saw that, and I grabbed that, and I knew that I was never going to open those and drink them. Uh, so... I, I think there are cases when uh, you're, you're, you're looking at, you know, a stack of money versus seeing something that's supposed to be a collectible and you're not going anywhere near it because you realize that it's not going to be worth much. I mean, people are buying things because they have a com- commemorative label on it. Uh, imagine buying uh, uh, Old Farcer, the Statesman that came out you know, because it was a movie tie-in. I mean, nobody would ever care about that or buy that. And there are people that are out there, especially new people, that are taking advantage of uh, buying stuff like that because they think it's going to have some kind of a major value. And they don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So uh, if I'm being um, a hypocrite, I'm at least a hypocrite that has a little bit of knowledge in what I'm doing with it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so in your opinion, I mean, are these, are these, do you think you sold too early? You know, talking about all these Booker 25ths and whether they're, you know, you, you got rid of some of your, your Black Maple Hills. I mean, yeah. the, the, the values are continually increasing and, and I don't know if we're going to see a, a max or a, a peak because they're not these. making any more of it. They're not making any more of it, right? And I, I mean, uh, the unicorns are probably just going to keep going up. Do you do you agree with that? And do you think you you might have gotten out a little too early? Um, I probably did. I probably uh, lost about twenty percent, but I don't mind doing what I did when I did it. Um, you know, it's like it's like playing the stock market. There's never a good time to to get out. And if you look at um, the tracking and the trending for collectible whiskey that they're they're keeping track of now and some of the magazines and uh, some of the auctions you know there's some things that are just incredibly uh valuable um if you look at something like a um linnell's uh the red hook yeah yeah the red hook rye if you look at a um the uh, bitter truth rye, some of those uh, older eyes that uh, that KBD put out a while ago that, you know, they put names on. Uh, I think I saw a uh, Blue Smoke, fr- Blue Smoke is a uh, barbecue restaurant in uh, New York. And they did a private label of a Van Winkle and Blue Smoke did uh, a private barrel of Van Winkle. That, that went absolutely crazy. So if I had things like that um i I probably would have held on to them i didn't have any of those but i probably would have held on to those a little bit longer because those those will those just have a cult status to them and the red hawk rye is uh probably somewhere around ten fifteen thousand dollars now is my guess if somebody yeah they're they're crazy i know like five grand might have been something about a year and a half ago but now they've just gone insane Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's people out there that are willing to to put that money out there, and they want they want that shelf trophy. Uh, the people that have the uh, uh, the Van Winkle twenty five year old, you know, that came out at what about two thousand dollars. They're now going for ten grand. Yeah, I think something they, like that. I think they're probably north of ten grand now. I've seen it, I've seen it for higher than that. Um, you know what 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 I'm seeing, and I put this in the blog. Uh, my recent post, you're seeing people in. Oh, you guys still there? Yeah, yeah, we're still here. Yep. Okay. Your, your picture disappeared for a second. It only uh, pops when we talk. <laughs> all right. Uh, I saw a um, New York. There's a couple different uh, people. L.A. There's a few people, and in uh, D.C. There's a guy, and they're buying up the secondary market at 
pretty much what secondary is and then reselling it again. So they're, so they're rebuying it from the secondary and then reselling it. So what's that called? The, the, the third dairy? Well, I don't know. Like I, I was funny because I had this, this, this sort of enlightening moment too, when I was thinking about the three tiered system, I was like, it's more like the six or yeah. seven tier system now. <laughs> right. right. Because it, yeah. it goes in the hands of one or two or three consumers before it actually hits the hand of somebody that's actually going to open the bottle. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, and a lot of those are uh, are are going to be gifted uh, for expense accounts, and um, some of it is probably wives or you know girlfriends giving them to husbands. Uh, I don't want to sound sexist, but I, if I had to take a wild guess, I'd say that. It's not too many husbands giving it to their wives. Uh, You're probably right. Yeah. Probably, it's probably accurate. Yeah, I, you know, that's that. That's my guess. I mean, it uh, has it happened. I'm sure it probably has. But uh, guys uh, are um, foolish enough to want to spend uh, five thousand dollars on a three hundred dollar bottle of booze. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, and you mentioned like I guess Kentucky Owl or Kentucky Owl Rye in the the article, and uh, you know it, it is kind of crazy that it's priced that high. Do you see that at, as a a long term investment for for that particular brand because it will be like starting to put out who knows what with the the Stoli yeah. endeavor and whatnot? But it's I'm with you. It seems kind of weird that that it's valued so much but it is pretty good whiskey well it's it's never had the legendary appeal that other things have had that and that and that's why they are what they are um you know it's it's like the it's the first uh, van winkle decanter and that's way up there but it's not crazy it's not i think it's probably around six thousand dollars uh, it might be more now since the second decanters come out, um, but that one, that one went up and for probably like the last two years is stabilized. Um, and part of that is that if you, have you ever had the uh, the Van Winkle decanter, the twenty three year old? No, no, <laughs> the, never seen. You know who you're talking to <laughs> yeah. over here? We're we're just well, laymen. Yeah, we're <laughs> we're early times bottled and bond kind of people yeah, over here. We're peasants. <laughs> no, I, I I I had it with five of the guys. We each had a sip. We all pitched in, bought a shot of, it, and each had a sip of it. And it was okay. It was pretty warty, <laughs> but um, but I wouldn't call it legendary. Uh, its legend is in what it is, and that's I think where you see a Kentucky Owl is that uh it's a self-created legend um <laughs> you know it's not from what's in that bottle it's not like Linnell's where you're going to be drinking one of the best rise that's ever been produced um so but there's <clears throat> there's cheaper ways to drink the type of rye that's in a Linnell's that's not called Linnell and it isn't that ex- as ex- anywhere near as expensive but still, people want to drink it that way. Um, so, um, with the owl, I don't see it happening. I think that uh, Kentucky owl might be something like the best way to maybe take a shot in the dark at it. If it does anything, is it'll be like the sour mash from E. H. Taylor, where there was one of them at the beginning, and there really wasn't that much put out. And people need it to complete their verticals, so you might see something like that. Mm-hmm. Like they'll have to fill it to get all the batches yeah. or whatever. Fair, fair assessment. So the um, you know, I kind of want to go back to a little bit how this first started. We were talking about bottle splits and people paying mm-hmm. five hundred dollars right. for an, an open bottle. So I guess first off, give our listeners a reason why they need to be cautious of that, and it, it should be pretty, <laughs> common sense. <laughs> yeah, pretty easy to see, but. Why? Why do you think that people feel the need to to sell a, a half open bottle of of Pappy Twenty to you know to make some money back? Maybe because they realize that they They're like overpaid oh, or something. Yeah. Well, it, the story usually goes something like, um, "I open this one up, and it's not for me." You know, does anybody want to buy what's left? And oddly enough, a lot of times, it's half of the bottle is left. Now I don't know <laughs> how it got to half a bottle if it wasn't for them. 
<laughs> yeah, it was just a bad couple days. You yeah, know, that that like fifteenth try was going to be the next. It's like yeah, when you when you get to the last bite of your steak and you're like, oh, it was overdone. Yeah, yeah. If if you look at my bottles, it weren't for me. It's barely past the neck. You know, it's just a you know a half an ounce. An ounce has been poured out of, it and that's it. Um, but uh, which is probably another reason to to be suspicious. But um, you know the. Um, I, I guess you got to trust the person. Uh, and I mean, if, if you know the person and you know that they're, you know, they're, they're absolutely positively honest, that might be one thing, but there's not that many people out there. I mean, most of us know each other from whiskey. We don't know each other from childhood or, um, or that sort of thing. It's not like anybody's ever uh, pulled you from in front of a train or uh, saved you on a battlefield that's earned their credibility. So, uh, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, it's tough, but people do it. People, people buy it. There's, there's websites and there's, uh, social media groups that are just bottle spot groups. Right. And I mean, but don't be wrong. I, I think there is, there is something good in people that will sell a, a two ounce sample of something for, uh, you know, not at cost, but much cheaper than you would pay for most of the bars in the country. However, again, you have to have a validity of the source that it's coming from. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I would, the majority of the time are, are even greater than the majority of the time you're fine, but that's hard to, that's hard to figure out. And, um, you've got to, you've got to build up a lot of credibility for somebody to trust you that way. Yeah, I think the much better way to do the sample is to do like a trade, sample trade, kind of, you know, you send them something, you you give me back. I think that's much much smarter way to do go about it. Yeah, I think that, that you stand the best chance with something like that. Something like that better than someone saying, I'm going to open up this bottle of Linnell's and everybody that's going to get a one-ounce sample is going to send me $400. Mm-hmm. So uh, I guess give me give me some examples of uh, some of those bottles that you think that you have. You've... I've just thought of this. I've done that before. The yeah. I've bid on the Red Hook Rise oh, know, yeah. on samples. Yeah, so the, I'm like I'm one of those stupid it. stupid people was talking about. But. Yeah, well, at least you would have had a shot, but you, <laughs> yeah. didn't, you didn't win, so it doesn't matter. Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of those bottles that you think you've opened that you said, "All right, well, I can I can get rid of this one. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to stomach it." I, I don't, I've, I've never, I've never s- sold a partial bottle before. Um, I've had people that, <clears throat> uh, people that have come over that we've done some tastings and, uh, some, uh, hanging around at the house and people will be like, Oh, you know, look, doesn't look like this one's ever been open. And I'll be like, Oh no, I opened it. I had a one shot and I didn't really like it. And they'll be like, well, can I buy that then? Cause I like it. And I'll be like, all right. I, I remember those one was a centennial um, mm-hmm. and um, they bought it from me. So they asked me, um, I hadn't planned on selling it. So I can't say I've never sold a partial bottle, but I've never offered one up for sale and I've never done it online. Uh, it's always been in person. So the person that well, that's a little bit different where the, you know, the person's actually seeing the bottle, being able to taste it first, uh, you know, but uh, it it's not something that um, that I'll probably ever do, you know, or ever get into because I, you know, I just I'm kind of against it. I, I you know, I think that um, yeah, you sold all your bottles off. You have no more to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> I still have I still have probably 500 bottles um, that are open, and uh, you're nuts. Uh, there's a, yeah, yeah, I am, and, <laughs> and, and there's probably 150 of those I'll never drink again another shot of because they just, they're not very good. Right. And, um, I'm kind of getting tired of being the guy that buys the bottle to, to get one, but you know, but at the same time, there's curiosity involved with it. Um, I remember I was at Trader Joe's with my wife and Trader Joe's had their own bourbon. And I was like, geez, I wonder what Trader Joe's bourbon is like, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. So I bought it, I took it home, and I had some of it. And, you know, it was pretty good. You know, I, I haven't been back to it. I haven't had a second pour from it because there's so many other options. But I, it's not that I haven't drank more of it because I don't like it. 
it's probably because um, there's just too many options. And I don't see people coming over to my house wanting to drink Trader Joe's bourbon either. <laughs> probably not right it's no. it always seems to be the case is when you when you have a nice collection you have people over the last thing they want to do is just drink your your everyday things that i set on the shelf right yeah exactly there's there's a few things that i um i still want to kind of keep in the back to make it really difficult for them to find um and um because there's probably about two or three pours left in it when it's gone it's gone forever and uh you know, some of those things are, are, are classics and Absolutely. Uh, great old Willet bottlings and, and things like that. Uh, so, so when you, when you buy a lot of these things that you just are sparked out of curiosity, I mean, is it because you, you necessarily don't, you're, you're just really curious about it or maybe there's something that you have to find out for yourself because you don't trust somebody other's reviews or anything like that? Um, as, as crazy as it sounds, sometimes I'll buy something in anger to try to prove that it sucks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's like, okay, I got what I wanted. It sucks. Now what do I do with it? Uh -huh. uh, but usually I, that's, that's not the reason I'm buying things. I'm buying things because th there's some reputation. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, uh, there's reputation coming out that it's supposed to be pretty good. Um, I've heard, um, you know, positive things from other states that it's already been released in. Uh, I've read something that's interesting. Um, I, um, there's a, there's a new, uh, not new, but they're a newer, they're a craft distillery up in Vermont, uh, called Med River. And they've been doing some interesting, um, bottlings. And so they came out with a, Maple finish. They came out with the PX finish rum. Uh, they just came out with the burnt rock uh, uh, bourbon. And I'm like, you know, this is a craft place that's up there. And they're doing it themselves. It's their stuff. And I was curious of what it tasted like because I'm not going to be able to walk into a bar and ask for those and try them. So I bought them. And they're young. Um, uh, but uh, they're good yeah. for craft. Good for craft. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's that's kind of, you know, we always say, oh, it's good for craft on the show. But I think, you know, you had a you had a funny tweet not too long ago that said there's so many nice ways that reviewers say the boo sucks and they just need to grow a pair and say it. So <laughs> is this yeah, is instead it, of saying it says it's young and yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I gave Fred Minnick a hard time uh a few months back. I said, uh, I'm so tired of you saying this would be good in a cocktail. You know, <laughs> Just be good with some coke in it. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's. <laughs> when you say good in a cocktail, you're usually giving it a seventy, um, you know, and and then the num and the numbering system is off anyway, and the rate, you know, in ratings, and I've talked about that before, where the the ratings are are skewed because you know eighty percent of the ratings are somewhere between eighty five and ninety five. Um, I they don't publish anything that's below seventy. So if something's really horribly putrid, you're never going to find out about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, so if it's in the low 80s, that means it's bad. Pretty much, and no, and and you and but the the producer doesn't think it is because you'll see the shelf tags or the ha hang tags that double gold, right? <laughs> Everything's got a double gold. Yeah. Yeah, 89. You know, you, you enter it in enough places, you're going to be able to get something out of it. Uh, one place was, uh, it was, it was funny as hell. I was on a cruise ship and there was this whiskey that I've never seen before, never heard before. And they were selling it and it had gotten the platinum medal at some, um, country fair, in New York state. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, that's about as low as you can go. Mm -hmm. That's reaching. <laughs> I mean, nobody's even entering stuff like that. Um, and I think it's funny cause you know, you had mentioned 89, like when I was in school getting an 89 on a test, like that was a good day. Uh, 80, 81 was a good for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, you would think it, it and, um, scores of scores have gotten a, a little bit better. I, mean, I don't know if you noticed what they did this year with, uh, um, whiskey advocate where now they have a panel that's retasting to come up with the final 
top of the year, the, what do they do? 30 best. Yeah. I didn't really read into it too much, but well, it's funny you say that. Cause well, finish your point. I want to follow up that with a question. Sure. I'm sitting here having a little sip myself. Um, they, um, so what they've done now is they've taken the top or the better, uh, rated whiskeys from the year and retasted them uh, in a panel format rather than an individual format where the or- initial and original uh, scores came from. And then the panel gives it a new score. So the winner this year uh, of the uh, whiskey of the year actually has two scores. They have the original score and then they have the panel score. And that's confusing as hell. <laughs> are they actually different? Yeah, they're they're too different because Fred Minnick gave uh, the uh, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof a ninety, I believe, and then the panel score gave it like a ninety five or a ninety six. Mm-hmm. And was it? You think I don't know? Was it done blind or was it? You know, you have you oh, have the label sitting, sitting in front of you. Out. Yeah. Uh, the panels the panel is supposedly blind. I don't I don't know. I don't think the individual is because uh, I don't think Fred's they, office yeah. say he has the samples just sitting right there and they're labeled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's you labeled know. unless they hire somebody to re-pour them and do it so that they can't tell, which I don't think too many people are doing. Supposedly, if you read um, uh, Paul, uh, was it Pat Packolt? Packolt. Uh, he no idea. We'll just take your word for it. Well, he does spirits review, and he supposedly in the morning they come in and they have them uh, ready for the tastings in the morning, and they go through the uh, that day's tastings, and they they're done blind because somebody pours it for them and gives it to them, so they don't know what they are. So it is possible to do it that way, but I don't think that's happening with. Uh, with most of the people out there. Right. Well, with, you know, you're talking about whiskey advocate and one of your tweets, you said whiskey advocate, top 20, they either bored or this is a rotten year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I, well, I'm kind of confused. Well, for me, I thought 16 was the rotten year and 17 was kind of a better year of, you know, the special releases, but. Well, let's take a look. I actually, uh, have that right in front of me. <laughs> and we can uh, get to check his notes, see what's going on here. It's great for radio. It really <laughs> is. Uh, okay, so you've got Elijah Craig as number one, um, and I'll go with that. I mean, Elijah Craig's good, and I understand what they did. They wanted to make it accessible because they were giving things like Sazerac 18 that were impossible to get. And they were giving things that were like $3,000. They were giving them whiskeys of the year. And, and that's just blindly stupid to, to, you know, it, it, to make something, you know, that's inaccessible, the whiskey of the year, or putting it on the top is unfair. And I actually, I wrote a big long thing about it. And I, I don't want to say that I was responsible for having them change it, but they did change it this year. So, um, so I like that. Um, all right. So the, uh, I don't, I won't go over every single one of them, but some of them are pretty, are, are just don't, don't make any sense. A little bit off the wall. Yeah. Well, for instance, they give, uh, a compass box, uh, uh, young one, a, uh, number seven, um, I'm assuming it's not as good as to be number seven because I've never had it. There's a lot of scotch in here, and there's a there's a lot of Isla scotch in here. Um, there's there's Lavagulin, there's an Ardbeg, uh, there's uh, Bravaki, and I'm not I'm not necessarily a uh, a peat head. I don't really want that much uh, peat. So you've got to have a special. Um, taste to to want that and I, I think that you'll probably find that most scotch drinkers are not isla people i mean there's people that are that do isla that are just iron fist isla uh people and they'll never switch but i, I that's not what i'm looking for when i'm uh 
drinking scotch usually. Little and, book number eleven. The little book's a tough one. I mean, I don't know. I've never really, uh, really, you know, played or actually had it, so I have no idea. Um, you know, I guess the other question is to say, like, is is there like one credible source when it comes to all these whiskey reviews or something like that? Because you know, you've got whiskey advocate, you've got Jim Murray, you've got other people that come out with their own bourbon of the year, or whiskey of the year. So at what point does it just become too much that it's just constant? This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. We're not fortune tellers, but when you lace up your new Stronghold work boots, it's easy to see the future does look strong. Danner has been making boots for 85 years for the unforgiving Pacific Northwest. This means Danner boots come with deep roots. And the new Stronghold work boot does just that. This is what happens when you take iconic quality and run it into modern technology. You get tomorrow's classic today. Get into the Stronghold for strength that starts right from where you stand. Order online or find your local store at Danner.com. That's D A. N N E R dot com. The State of Logic podcast is like no other. We don't have the same focus as so many other podcasts where we're just going to talk about business or politics or whatever. We talk about everything with everyone, intellectuals, comedians, and celebrities alike. Sometimes it's a 20 minute interview, sometimes it's a three hour interview. But at the end of the day, it's a great conversation that we often laugh about and learn something from at the same time. Come check us out at the State of Logic podcast. <laughs> Little Booksy tough one. I mean, I don't know. I've never really, uh, really, you know, played or actually had it. So I have no idea. Um, you know, I guess the other question is to say, like, is is there like one credible source when it comes to all these whiskey reviews or something like that? Because, you know, you've got Whiskey Advocate, you've got Jim Murray, you've got other people that come out with their own bourbon of the year, or whiskey of the year. So at what point does it just become too much that it's just constant? Yeah, it. But the one thing that they that ha, somebody hasn't done is they haven't come out with like a uh, chart that shows you everybody on on a single line and shows you what they rated it. Because um, usually that's not universal, and I think that uh, you know your Jim Murray is. I used to really be a Jim Murray fan, and I've completely taken a complete u-turn and now i really don't like jim murray and i haven't bought his book the last two years um you know you think it's just too much like why, why? Cor- like corporate influence or something like that or what's what's your what's your take well, he's, well he he's obviously very very um slanted towards certain brands and from what i hear um he's getting paid as a consultant by certain brands so you can't have it both ways. You can't be, um, you know, there, there, was a, there was a reviewer that I uh, gave a hard time to at one point because he was going around helping them market a particular brand when it was introduced. And at the same time, he was re- reviewing and rating that same brand. And I'm like, how can you do both of those things? You really can't do both of those things. And he he doesn't anymore, but uh, a lot of people are still doing it. Right. I mean, everybody tries to figure out a way to side hustle and make a buck here and there. So, I mean, you can't I, – I understand there is a conflict of interest there, but, you know, that kind of is what it is. I, I guess the other kind of question I, I want to throw at you is when you look at these different competitions, whether there's San Francisco or whether there's that random one in New York, you know, a lot of these – a lot of the – uh, distillers that are pretty much already prominent, right? The Buffalo Traces, Jack Daniels, whomever, they nobody act, they don't actually submit anything anymore, right? It, it's more or less a lot of these uh, young guns trying to make themselves a the name of the market. It seems to be more like a um, like a marketing aspect for for a lot of them rather than actual whiskey coming out of these competitions. Well, you have to submit your whiskey, 
Um, you have to pay a fee to have your whiskey accepted. Uh, you have to, <clears throat> um, a lot of times, if your whiskey wins, you have to pay to mention the trademark name of the, uh, the thing. And if you want to use their logo of their gold bar, their silver coin, or whatever the hell it is, you've got to pay them money to use those things. So it's a, it's a big scam that you get tied into once you start doing that. I'm part of a, uh, a group right now that we're trying to figure out a way to do this. But we want to buy, uh, we want to buy off the shelf whiskey that's available to do blind taste tests within our group and then do ratings. And then at the end of the year, do a table panel live tastings to come up with the finalists. And that's going to be hard as hell to do and expensive to do. But if you want to do it, it's really the only way to do it. Yeah. Because um, once somebody's sending you a sample, it has the, it has the possibility that it's tainted because if someone's going to send me a single barrel sample for me to taste that I'm going to put into my magazine, and I haven't tried that first to make sure that that barrel is a pretty damn good barrel, then I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem is they're, you know, they're sending these single barrels and all these expressions that most of the people aren't going to be able to try anyways. It's like these really limited expressions or, or so it kind of skews for me anyways, because as a buyer, you're not going to buy that exact barrel or whatever sample they were tasting at the competition. Um, exactly. I mean, um, I remember probably about five years ago, six years ago, uh, Heaven Hill won the um, Whiskey of the Year with their 18-year-old gift shop uh, that came out during the Kentucky Bourbon Festival. And that was, that was one that they won with. But that barrel had 150, 200 bottles to it. So you'll never be able to find that. Um, and of course, for the next uh, two years, I think, I think it was the, pretty sure it was the 18, they had stamped on the front of the bo bo uh, bottle, uh, winner of the uh, whiskey of the year winner. Uh, I don't even think they put a date on it. So, you know. So do you think uh, like single barrels should be eliminated from these competitions? They should just be like small batches? Uh, if the brand itself uh, is a uh, is marketed as a small batch, uh, as a small batch, then do it as a small batch. If it also comes out as a single barrel, then that should probably be put into a single barrel category, just like all the privates should be put into a private category. Gotcha. So I guess, um, you know, let's kind of like shift it a little bit, right? I mean, you had, you had mentioned that distillery from Vermont that's, that's doing a lot of good things. And this is one thing that, that we see a lot of times that people want to talk about. They want to talk about the growth of the market and saying there's, there's now 4,000 craft distilleries that are happening and growing across the nation. So what do you see as, as the movement of craft, whether it's a good thing, a bad thing, whether most of them are giving everybody else a bad rap? Like what, what, what's your, what's your kind of thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my, my thoughts on craft changed a little bit <clears throat> when I had an interesting conversation with a guy and I'll tell you what that was. Uh, and just people throwing things together, jumping into it, and with with very little knowledge or education, there are some people that are going down to uh, Moonshine University and taking their course and trying to get as good as they can with it and get schooled. There's some people that are hiring um, uh, other people to help them. And sometimes those other people have no clue. Sometimes they are helping them from a, a, a far distance. Um, I went to Catskills Distilling, and it was a really interesting afternoon that I spent with the uh, owner named Monty Sack. And he told me this story where he decided that he wanted to start a distillery, 
and he befriended Lincoln Henderson. And Lincoln Henderson would tell him what to do and, and would, would be helping him out to kind of uh, pinpoint and get the, the, the whiskey exactly where it should be. So he would note and tell him what he's tasting. He would send him samples and Lincoln would say, oh, well, this is what happens when you, when you get that, this is what's wrong with it. And when this happens, this is what's wrong with it. And you did this wrong because you got that flavor out of it. And he slowly started to make the whiskey so that he would take these flaws out. And oddly enough, somebody told me this, that um, it was a massive distiller, which kind of floored me. One of my favorite uh, tasting notes is like a bubblegum tutti frutti flavor. And they said that that's actually a flaw. <laughs> and, and I was like, that's a flaw that I want. <laughs> <laughs> that's what to say. It sounds delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're not tasting that in very many of these. And when I taste it, I'm like, Oh, I want this one. This, this is, this is the one I want to buy more of the one bottle. And that's one of the things I say all the time is, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the true measure of a whiskey is would I buy a second bottle. Or if I try it in a bar, will I go to a store and buy it? Uh, you know, that really sets them apart. And when you're dealing with craft whiskey, um, I can't really tell you that, you know, I would say that of 50 bottles of craft whiskey I've bought, maybe two or three times have I ever bought a second bottle of it. Um, I don't... It's a hard market, right? I mean, it it definitely is. Uh, I mean, I mean, well, it's hard to take that leap of faith, you know, because most of them are expensive, and so you're like, and then you know it's young, so it's like it's hard to give them a chance. It is. It's very hard to give them a chance, and I, um, you know, if you look at how um, Hill Rock got started, it's they they have got a very interesting story where a uh, venture capital guy got involved. He went out. He built a beautiful distillery up in upstate New York. He actually went and he hired Dave Pickerel to help him as the master distiller to start, although Pickerel only shows his face there once in a while. And um, they uh, came out with the Solera aging, and they were one of the very first ones in the United States that pushed the Solera aging, and then they came out with a rye, then they came out with a malt whiskey. And now they're doing some experimental barrel finishes and things like that. Uh, and they specialize pretty much in smaller, um, uh, underaged, I, I'll call it underaged barrels. Uh, you need the age. And, I, and I, I, I'm not a believer of the small barrel. You can rush it and you can make it faster because it's a smaller barrel. Mm -hmm. I've, never, I've never tasted a smaller barrel that I ever thought was, you know, blew my mind. Uh, I've tasted some craft stuff before that they kept around longer. Uh, matter of fact, I'm getting ready to pick up one that's a, uh, that they've kept around for seven years. It's a brewery and they started doing uh, rum. And when they started doing rum, they started putting away some whiskey. So I'm getting, I'm going to be picking up this one that's a seven year old, uh, whiskey. So I'm really curious to taste what a craft that's seven years old tastes like. Yeah. You typically don't see that, right? You typically, um, if you're lucky, it's two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the lucky barrier, but you know, even if it gets better around four, then hope, and I haven't really had any craft that is six years or anything like that yet. Yeah. You can, um, you, know, you could find some things like it, but it, it's quirky, like something like McCarthy's was craft. I mean, they, they were, he was in O to V and doing a lot of brandies and things. And he went overseas, fell in love with uh, the Isla style. So he started making his own Isla style uh, single malt. So that's McCarthy's. His is like, I think, six years old, uh, although he sold the company. Then you've got places like St. George that's been around now. So they've got some five, six, seven-year-old stuff. Uh, you've got um, uh, Charbay that's 
you know, but Charvay is so strange and off the wall. <laughs> yeah, that, they're out there. I mean, I had I had one that was cannabis finish from Charvay. It was <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah. It was kind of crazy too. Yeah, you could, you could talk shops, whatever. Yeah, you you could talk about Charvay for an hour. Uh, that that's how strange Charvay is. So there are a few out there, but the bottom line is most of these places have to get money back to the bank. They got to pay their loans off really fast. So by the time this stuff got co has color, they're putting it in a bottle and selling it. And that's usually not a very good thing because they'll sell one bottle in the tasting room, but they're not going to sell another bottle. It's good for cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> for cocktails. Yep. <laughs> Starting fires. Uh, oh man so you had you had mentioned you know we talk about whiskey a lot with you and everything like that but you had mentioned rum a few times are you are you jumping on the rum train too or are you uh are you still just gonna be uh be bourbon truth at the end of the day am i am i rum curious um, uh, i uh <laughs> i would say that uh rum it, yeah, the way that rum works you know rum the age on rum is the uh it has to have some of that in it so if it says it's 15 years old, it doesn't have to all be 15 years old. It just has to have 15 years old in it. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty tough to, to, to figure out. Um, I've got a hard enough time with whiskey to, to get better with whiskey. So I'm pretty much stuck with whiskey. I have been trying some rums. Uh, I'm curious to try a few of the new ones that are coming out that uh, they're bringing into the States. That is supposed to be really, really good, uh, but uh, I don't think the next big thing is rum. I think that I, I think the next big thing I, I'll still say the next big thing is probably going to be brandy. Uh, really, at first I, I didn't expect that because you know don't get me wrong, like everybody jumping on the rum train. Uh, there's that one distillery out of France that's pushing out their Armagnac, Armagnac that everybody's yeah. going crazy for, um, but I haven't really anybody talked about brandy too much. Yeah, I think brandy will be one of the big things i mean if you go out and try to find Laird's 12 year old uh apple brandy you, you you'll spend a lot of time looking for it and trying to get it if it's brought into your state um it, it's it's say like Laird's Laird's l-a-i-r-d-s okay Laird's Laird Laird's is actually the Laird's story is probably as close as you can get to the truth of what Michter's uh, used to be. I mean, they, they you know, the, the new Mectors that's owned by Chatham. I was about to say, wait, did, did they have a Washington uh, connection <laughs> too with a, with a nickel or a quarter or whatever? La Laird's actually has records signed by Washington where the troops, uh, where they supplied Applejack to the troops and they have documentation going back to the 1700s where their family actually had uh, a distillery make Applejack. So uh, other than Prohibition, they've been... Um, I, I'm trying to think if they got a license for Prohibition, but they, they moved their distillery from New Jersey to um, Virginia, but they have quite the bit of history. But the 12-year-old Apple Brandy is tough to find right now. Very, very tough to find. I think that people are starting to pick up on a lot more brandies and and then that's where I would, you know, that's where I would think would I be running out there buying the brandy that I think is going to be collectible next year or whatever? No, absolutely not. We're going to have a bourbon truth effect on, <laughs> on Laird's, uh, Laird's 12 year old. It was insane. It was so, like, because as soon as we, like, Fred was on Rum Curious and talked about Dorley's, like, uh, go to Total Wine, it's gone, you know. So, I was gonna say, you're going to Total Wine after this, yeah. I'm going to Total Wine, see if they got it. Yep, no, it, it that's what happens is because I'm like you, I'm too curious, it and it kills me. Like, I gotta know what it tastes like. No, I can, uh, Alf, oh, once we get done, um, we'll exchange stuff. I'll get you some of the uh, 12. Will you sell me some samples? <laughs> <laughs> A real Ten, Twelve dollars for two ounces. Yeah. yeah. Take a picture of my hand on the bottle pouring it. <laughs> I like it. We trust you. There we go. That made it back full circle, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're not going to say the real name, but Lloyd, thank you again for coming on the show tonight. Unless you had another question you wanted to ask, there, Ryan. Uh, I mean, real quick, I just because sure. I really like this. Because I kind of agree with this. You, your one tweet said, if Buffalo Trace and Pappy Van Winkle 
don't want secondary sales. They should put out an annual release good enough. You want to drink and not sell it. And I, I, I'm totally honest. Like uh, ever since Buffalo Trace has taken it over, I think the quality has just gone down and I just don't understand. Like I got a 12 year the other day and I opened it and drank it and I was like, damn it. I should have sold it. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with my 20 year. And it's like, huh, you know, was that so, a 12, 12 year Van Winkle? Well, yeah, the, yeah, the lot B or whatever. And then sure. I had a 20 year also opened and was quite disappointed, but well, the way, the way that they supposedly do it is that the Van Winkles have first crack at the weeded bourbons, and they keep uh, a lot of the Van Winkles low so that they can age longer. Um, I mean, for, for the most part, when you're talking about a 20 or a 23, they're not necessarily better. You're just putting them into hibernation, and you know, you're know you keeping them as cold as possible so they don't go bad. So... Their 12, what is the difference between their 12 and a Weller 12? Is it that they've gotten first crack at those barrels so that they can put the better 12 in there and then what's left over goes into the Weller barrels? But there was a time uh, and a point where they were tasting every single barrel and whatever. And then, uh, you know, uh, Julian was doing it. And I'm not really sure what the big... uh, uh, mysticism is for Julian because J- Julian didn't even want to be in the business. He, he wanted to, I think his degree was in economics and psychology or something like that. And he got dragged back into the business by his father in the eighties. So he didn't want any part of it. And then his, the luckiest son in the world, Ringo Van Winkle. Uh, now, now, now he uh, is tasting some of the barrels too. And it's like, well, you know, there's not some mysterious fairy that comes and taps you on the shoulder and says, okay, now you're a whiskey expert. You can go out and taste great barrels. Um, I've done plenty of barrel picks before, and I've had barrel, I've tried barrels before that other people liked. And I'm like, dude, you know, you, if you want to pick this one, that's fine, but I want nothing to do with it. So when you take that and you go to Buffalo Trace, and Buffalo Trace is putting something out, um, you know, they've only got, they've only got so much that they can, they can, they can do because 12 years ago, probably <clears throat> my guess is, uh, oh, 2020, 2022, somewhere around there. That's probably when they started putting a lot more of it away. So what they've got put away right now, what they've got is what they've got. So a lot of it's just not good. Um, and I think that's what you found is that you opened it and you were just like, yeah, but at the same time, you were probably expecting a lot more out of it. Well, I think I most mean, people are selling samples. Yeah. I mean, I think most people are, and that's just the, the, the lure of that brand. Um, did, I mean, yeah. oh. you can't, you can't get enough of the, the Facebook groups that, you know, they, they want to rap on everybody that says the words Pappy 10 or Pappy 12. <laughs> and, and they say, I just started drinking a few weeks ago and I'm trying but to I'm find trying. happy. So I, I admit, I find myself sometimes saying that Pappy 10 or 12 on that. <laughs> and I'm like, whoops, better not say that. But yeah, no, it, it's, you know, the, the whole thing, the whole, um, I, I, I would actually be kind of amazed if, somebody ever wrote a book just on the phenomenon of, of the, of Van Winkle and how it came to be what it is. And, um, it's, uh, what's happening. You mean, you mean the, the anti version of what's already out there? I think you can give both sides of it. You know, mm-hmm. I I'd probably throw Minnick a bone and let him, uh, tear <laughs> at it from both sides. If, if he, if he would do it, um, it, it, what's happening with the secondary sales and with, uh, um, you know, with the, th- with the three tier system uh, with, with Van Winkle is just, <clears throat> it's just crazy. There, there is that if you're reselling it, you're a horrible person. You should go to hell basically. But at the same time, they know that the stores are doing the same very, this very same thing, except they've inflated themselves with saying that, Oh, this is the distributor and the distributor can do whatever they want. Well, it just so happens that to, in order to get that those bottles of Pappy, you've got to buy a pallet load of Dr. McGillicuddy's or a pallet load of Fireball or 
uh, rain vodka or whatever it is, you've got to buy that in order or if you're going to get it. And I almost broke a pretty big story about this um, last year where a store sent me a photo of the sheet that the uh, Sazerac rep left behind of how much that he had to buy in order to get Pappy at the end of the year. And uh, I didn't do anything with it because I wanted to get a second uh, person that would be able to s tell me that they've at least seen that sheet before. And I couldn't get anybody to do it. So, mm -hmm. I, left, so I left it alone. But I don't think there's anybody that it's, it's a big mystery that they're thinking that uh, they mysteriously get different amounts of Pappy for different reasons. Um, you sound like it's like one of those things. It's it's like um, it's like a Don Coleone or a gangster thing. It's like <laughs> we can't pin them because we don't have enough proof, but we right. know it's there. So we'll just get them for tax fraud or something, right? Yeah, I mean, it almost happened with New York because in New York they do it a little bit differently with how you get your uh, allocations and how you get your um, uh, you, you get your allocated items. And there was some lawsuits. Uh, going around and sooner or later somebody's going to get fed up one of these uh, retailers and they're gonna they're gonna put their foot down they're, enough is enough I'm gonna you know try to put an end to all this stuff um, and you're gonna see you're gonna see it it's gonna hit the fan for sure well it'll be good when that day comes but <laughs> yeah, I don't see it happening anytime soon talk about no yeah. they, they, they're you know if you looked at the numbers of what they put out, I know that um, uh, I think it was was it Blake that uh, or was it uh, Breaking Bourbon? They put out a um, a list of what they what they uh, foresaw as the number of bottles that were put out this year, and uh, Sazerac put out a lot more uh, certain types. They put a lot more uh, Stag out. They put a lot more Van Winkle out. So they put a lot more out this year. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they took that from their other brands and that's why you don't see you know why should i put a weller 12 out when i can put a weller i can put a, a van winkle 12 out and get three times more money for it or two times more money for it oh absolutely yeah i was i was gonna say the same exact thing i, <laughs> I you don't see weller 12 near as much as you see floppy anymore exactly but that's just the way it is yeah, and they're saving and they're saving antique because those black barrels are going to become what they're going to need in the future for uh, for the Van Winkle and any special uh, uh, weeded that they want to do. So it's um, it's kind of crazy out there what's going on, and every every year it happens over and over again, and it seems like it gets worse. Yeah, I don't think it's getting any better anytime soon, but I think that will. Uh... That'll save it for a, another episode here in the yeah, future, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll rabbit hole later. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely do that later. So I want to say thank you again for for coming on the show. You know, we're gonna have you on again here in a few months. Uh, so get another list of things you want to gripe about and blog about, and we'll we'll be sure <laughs> to talk about it. Won't, won't take long for me to get pissed off. <laughs> yeah, so we can do it tomorrow. Yeah, we, we like that. That's good. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Good deal. So um, if you want to follow Lloyd, make sure you can you can find him at Bourbon Truth on Twitter, as well as you go to bourbontruth.tumblr.com. Read all his good blogs. I, I swear he's he's one of the most unfiltered, but <laughs> yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a really good, I guess you could say uh I don't know, it gets you gets you back to kind of like focusing on what's important again. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I, he has a great article around there that says it just starts with I don't care. But it, it goes for like 150 lines of I don't care if you got some special label from the TTB that doesn't classify you as a bourbon <laughs> whiskey, all this other kind of stuff. So make sure you go and you follow him on there. At the same time, make sure you subscribe to uh, Bourbon Pursuit on iTunes. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Bourbon Pursuit. And if you do like the show, please consider supporting us, patreon.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And I want to say thank you, a shout out to all of the people that were actually watching this live today uh, that were actually on Patreon. So if you do support the show, you can actually get links and watch these remote interviews we do to actually see it happening live and ask your own questions as we go. There wasn't a whole lot of questions that were asked <laughs> this time, but there was some good kind of commentary happening as a sidebar. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, please give us or leave us reviews and fill out those surveys, right? Absolutely. BurdenPursuit.com slash survey. Yeah, so we can 
figure out what you like. Please give us show suggestions, comments, feedbacks. We love hearing that because we want to know what to bring to you all. Everybody uh, have a good day and we'll see you next time.